to, ex to explain it, guess what? They explain it. I think the doctrine of the Trinity is unexplainable. <laughs> and I think when you explain it, you diminish it. Leave the mystery. Let me give you an illustration from business. Any of you physicists here or engineers? Any engineers? How many civil engineers do we have here? Okay, one, two, okay. I didn't have to do this too. Okay. In light, we call it electromagnetic radiation, right? Is light waves or particles? Both. It can be both. It can be both particles and waves. Waves are different than particles. Well, it has to be particles because my computer is using it as particles. Right? My computer is, is directing to the pixels according to light with regard to particles. But it has to be waves because when I put a prism up against the light, it turns it into a whole bunch of different colors. So which is it? Nobody knows. <laughs> so, do we go around saying, you know, if I'm a physicist and I say, it's waves, it's only waves, another physicist will say, well then your universe doesn't work. So as a physicist, I have to maintain something that is constant in my universe, which I can't explain, that I use all the time, that's absolutely necessary, but I can't tell you whether it's this or whether it's that. That's what I say about the Godhead. There's one God and only one God. There's not three gods. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You say, well, Tim, how does that work? I don't know. <laughs> Great is the mystery of godliness. Right? Okay. So that's always my dilemma when somebody says, you ask, do you believe in the Trinity? But the bottom line on the, that question usually is, do you believe in the Trinity? Sure. Because people who say they don't believe in the Trinity are almost always saying they don't think Yeshua is divine. I believe that Yeshua is 100% divine and 100% human. I believe he has no beginning. He's uncreated. He always has been. And he always will be. And so I cannot explain the incarnation. I leave it in the mystery. Just the way Paul did. Okay? I can live with the mystery. You know why? Because I live with the most beautiful woman in the world who's my wife. Her name is Paulette, and there's no way in the world you can explain why she accepted me. Does God want us to be monogamous? Monogamous. Yes. I can say that beyond any shadow of a doubt. And then the next question is, well then, how come Abraham more than one wife? How come Jacob had more than one wife? How come David had more than one wife? God wants us to be monogamous. I, I derive this from what we what we can call progressive revelation. Amen. Okay? Progressive revelation means that God gives us in seed form His truth, and then He expands it and makes it more clear through the ages as the Scripture is written. Amen. Okay. So Genesis 2:24, and man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto that is cling unto his wife. Literally, devic in modern Hebrew is used to glue something. I mean, devic in modern Hebrew is the word for glue. Devak to glue something. Devic. That's the word we have in Genesis 2 24. Uh, so I can translate it this way. A man shall leave his father and mother and be glued to his wife, and the two shall be one. Every Shabbat, when the wife does, uh, the man does the Eshet Kail. You know, a woman of valor, when we bless our wives in their Shabbat, a woman of valor, who can find for her, for her worth as far above jewels? The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of pain. Wait a minute. If polygamy is the way it should go, couldn't you trust? If you, you can't trust this one, couldn't you trust that one? <laughs> couldn't you trust yourself to this one or that one or this one? No. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of pain. So now to know. God's will, God's purpose, God's stated will is that there should be one man and one wife. And by the way, it doesn't say Adam and Steve, it says Adam and Eve. <laughs> okay, so you say, well, what about this progressive revelation? 
You see, when Paul, when Yeshua quotes this verse in Matthew 19, when they say to him, you know, they come to him and they say, what about divorce and so forth? And he says, don't you know that it was never this way from the beginning? Have you not read, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife and the two shall be one? Yeah. All right, so why did he bring that verse up there? He says, two, two for life, not three, four, five, two. That's God's purpose and his plan. Now, he does give a provision for divorce where there is infidelity. That's very clear. Okay, but now if you keep going, Paul brings the same text up in Ephesians 5. Right? He says, you know, let each man have his wife, let each wife reverence her husband. He says, and he starts out in verse 25 where he says, Husbands love your wife as the Messiah loves you, and you love Jesus himself for her. And then, Maybe I can ask you to read it. Ephesians 5, 5, 5, 5. Husbands, love your wife. So, I can't hear you. My cursor goes crazy. I can't... 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 Just as the Messiah loved the uh, Pagan and gave himself for her. Uh, can't get my cursor in there. There's something the way that we're setting this up. Well, okay. Anyway, I can't scroll for some reason. Uh, the way that computer hooked up to this uh, projector doesn't let me scroll. Oh, there. Oh, almost. Right. Yes. So that he might sanctify our cleanser, washing the word, that he might sin. And he goes on, and you can look in your Bibles, and he says, so. A wife should reverence her husband, right? He says, but I'm really not talking about that. What am I talking about? The Messiah and his pagan love. Oh. Right. So from the very beginning, the marriage relationship is a foreshadow and a type of the relationship of Yeshua and his pagan love. I've often said, when you think about it, there's a couple, there's numbers of things in life that God has done that are a little bit, you know, it's hard to explain. Circumcision is one of them. You think to yourself, what in the world is that? But if you start to think about the way babies are made, that's kind of crazy too. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to be as delicate as I can. Why didn't God just make a baby bush? <laughs> you know, and there's berries on the bush, and you go and you take, you know, you take a berry off and you eat it, you get pregnant, you have a baby. It's so much easier. Why did He do that? Because marriage was to foreshadow the relationship of Messiah and his Kehillah, which is a relationship of love, of intimacy. He wanted the marriage relationship to be something that we as humans could understand his love for us and our, what our love was to be for him. When a husband misses his wife and longs to be home with her, then he has a sense of what Yeshua is feeling right now. He longs to be with us. Is that possible? Yes. Okay. So, how many wives did Yeshua have? One. When, when, when you get into polygamy, you ruin the picture. And every time you have polygamy in the Acts, in the Tanakh, it breeds trouble. Every time. You go read and look. What is the, what is the second wife called in Hebrew? She's called the rival. That gives you something, yeah. doesn't it? Okay. Malachi. Uh, next is please explain Romans 5, 14, 15, and Galatians 3, 25. Okay, that was Romans 5, 14 to 15. 14 to 15, and Galatians 3, 25. 3, 25. I'm glad they didn't say 3, 24. Uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not seen in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. But, now the question is, can I control this man? Romans 3, not Romans 5, sorry. It's Romans 3. Oh, 3, I thought you said 5. Okay, thank you very much. Is that right here? That's the Romans 5, 14. Okay, I think. Romans 5, 14. 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 Romans 5, 14.
Um, uh, brother Tim, uh, sorry for the error. Romans six, Romans six, four, fourteen, fifteen. Romans six, fourteen, Yes. Okay. So, Romans six, fourteen to fifteen, and Galatians twenty-five. Right. Yes. I love him. Why do I love him? 
because he loves me. I, we love him because he first loved us. When I see what he gave to me in his son, when I see what he's given to me in life, I say, Lord, what can I do to please you? And all he says is obey me. And guess what? When you obey me, I'll bless the socks off you. It's to your advantage. I don't have to, I get to. Well, that's what it means. Okay. Uh, Galatians 3.25 But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Yeah. Actually, the word tutor is pedagogy. Pedagogy. Do you know what a pedagogue is? Here, maybe I can... I don't know if I can get you. No, I can't. I was going to put the Greek up for you, but my cursor isn't working. Yeah. yeah. Pedagogue. A pedagogue is not a tutor. That's a bad translation I have there. The tutor is the teacher. The pedagogue in the Greek society was a well-trusted servant or steward who, whose responsibility it was to take the children from the house to the place of instruction, make sure they got there safely, and then make sure they got home and did the work they were supposed to do when they came home. Yeah, you. The pedagogue is the one that makes sure the student listens to the teacher and does the work. Okay? So what was the pedagogue uh, that took us from our place to the tutor. The Torah. That's it. Well, then you know what? If the, if the tutor is the pedagogue of the Torah, yes. Say, well, then the Torah is no longer needed. We're no longer under a Torah uh, tutor. Right? Okay. So let me use it this way. Um, this never happened to me, but I'll use the illustration anyway. When I started playing the trumpet, when I started learning to play the trumpet, okay, um, I never had any trouble practicing. In fact, my parents gave me, a, uh, you can only practice two hours a day. We can't stand any more of them. <laughs> two hours a day is all. After that, you have to go out in the garage. So, okay, no problem. But there are a lot of kids who need somebody to keep after them when they're first learning a musical instrument to practice. But if they start learning how to practice, and they start liking to play the piano or play the trumpet or whatever, they don't need anybody anymore to push them. They love to do it. They like to do it. So the Torah was used, first of all, to show us our sinfulness and to bring us to the Messiah. But once we come to the Messiah, the, to the Torah no longer needs to function to bring it to the Messiah. We're willing to go. We're willing to be there. We're ready to be there. Let me use another illustration. When you start out in school, you learn your addition, your subtract, subtraction, your division, your multiplication, right? Once you... Once you get to high school, do you continue being taught your additions and your subtractions? No. No, you don't need to. Why? You already have it. Do you still use it? Yes. Yeah. You just don't need a pedagogue to keep twisting your arm and twisting your ears on you do it. That's what he's saying here. The Torah had a function to bring us to the Messiah. It no longer has that function because we have already come to him. It has additional functions. Right? That's the next question. What do you say about the doctrine or theology of grace that the law is irrelevant because we are already in the dispensation of grace? Uh, yes. Um, it's always a sad thing when people put grace over against law. Let me use this illustration. I have a little eight or nine month old, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know exactly, I think nine month old granddaughter probably is the cutest nine-month-old person in the world. Okay, so when Esri comes over to Ima Mom Papa's house, um, and she gets a little bit older, and she's toddling around and so forth, and she gets close to the heater. And I say to Esri, don't touch the heater, it'll burn your hand. And she reaches out her hand to touch it, and I slap it and say, no, don't touch it. Is that grace or is that law? Grace. Somebody said grace. Somebody else said law. Which is it? Grace. When God gives, okay, let me use another illustration. I build a house, I have two floors, and I have a balcony. And I put a banister around the balcony that prohibits people from falling off. Even if somebody wants to fall off, they couldn't because the banister is too high. Is that law or grace? No, it's law. 
because I restrict them from doing what they otherwise could do or would do. Right? One last illustration. My wife really does not like to answer the door when she knows there's a door to door sales because she's a softy in heart and she always buys what they have to sell. She's so sorry for this. But afterwards, she wished she had. There was one time she bought a whole gallon of something. I don't even know what it was. And I don't think she knew what it was either. It was some kind of a cleanser or something. We never used it. Threw it out. But, but she bought it because she felt sorry for the person. And she said, Sweetheart, what, what am I going to do? I, you're, you know, you're not here and the doorbell rings and I, I know it's somebody and I, I don't want to just leave them out there on the porch. So I always, what can I do? I said, okay, here's the law. You open the door and you tell them, I'm not allowed to buy anything from you unless my husband's here. This is the law of our house. I'm not allowed to buy anything from you unless my husband is here with me. I'm sorry, it's not my rule, it's his rule. <laughs> you know, I'd love to buy things from you, but I cannot because he told me, and I'm under his submission, I'm, uh, I'm submission to, submitted to him, he's my authority. He said I can't buy anything from you. So when I told her that, I said, look, this is the rule. This is the law. You can't buy anything unless I'm here. A week later, she came, she said to me, oh, that was the most wonderful law you ever gave me. She said, now I have no problem. If the doorbell rings and I know it's somebody selling things, I just open it up with a big smile. I say, I'm really sorry. I can't buy anything from you because my husband said I can't let you see what he's here. Big smile. She said, and she said this to me, she said, it's so freeing. <laughs> so, is that law or grace? It's law and grace. You see, if you're not under the condemnation of the Torah, then the Torah is grace to us because it tells us how to walk, where to walk, and what to do and what not to do. And it gives us freedom to obey God. That's crazy. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, yeah. uh, that would be the last question for now. Okay. Unfortunately, due to our lack of time, we cannot accommodate all of your questions. So we will try to uh, have an answer later on. There will be a second session where we will be entertaining these questions again. But I think it's now time to break for lunch. Sure. <laughs>